All right, everybody, I got four o'clock, so we might want to go ahead and get started. I'm sure the recording has already started. If anybody, if Brittany, if you happen to hear um, some problem with me hearing me, just please let me know. Will do. Thank you very much. Great. So first of all, my name is Brian Dowd. I'm the Deputy Executive Director over Policy, Operations, and Compliance at the Department of Community Health. And I've been the business owner for EDD for about three years now. Excuse me, many of y'all may know me as the old waiver program director here at the Department of Community Health when I served a different function or I've, I've been around for about 23 years um, doing Medicaid, so you could know me from a variety of places. I want to thank you for um, attending our EVV uh, town hall that was specific to participant direction and specific to um, the fiscal intermediaries. We heard from participant directed folks that not only did they want their own webinars, but they wanted their own webinars by fiscal intermediary, and you wanted to make sure that the fiscal intermediary was participating. So we accommodated all of that. Um, we have also had other town halls that were specific to uh, participant direction. And I'll go over where we keep everything as part of this presentation. I've said on more than one occasion um, with the EVV compliance that when we went into it, we wanted to make everything fully transparent. And we have done that. We have put everything, all information available on our website, multiple websites. We've used every social media avenue that we could um, in order for information to be made available. As a participant directed individual or family, we are also making sure that you guys have access to everything. Uh, many, many, many of you have reached out to us and said, well, wait a minute, a lot of these things I don't need to be on. No, you don't. Some of them are very much targeted to traditional providers, but the information or part of the information may still be relevant to you. So we're not excluding you from anything. Also, I don't think any presentation has gone by where we haven't had participant directed individuals ask questions or specifically address some component of participant direction as part of the process. So I wanna encourage you all to continue to be engaged and I want to thank you um, for being so engaged in the process. We start every presentation with the mission of the Georgia Department of Community Health, which is to provide Georgians with access to affordable quality health care through effective purchase planning and oversight. So where are we with the continuum EVV implementation? We just for today's presentation, we wanted to give you an overall update. It's not very long. We have four or five slides that we're going to go through, and then um, we want to be able to answer any Q&As that you might have and capture those. I understand that um, we do have some individuals from Continuum on today. They are participating. Uh, they are having a little bit of trouble with uh, their connection and being able to use their microphone. Um, but I'm going to go through the slides anyway, and that was always the plan. And then if they aren't able to use their microphone at the end of the presentation, we always capture everything via recording and post it on the website. And we also uh, record any questions so that we can go back and answer those questions as well. So, uh, we continue to work with Continuum, and they are implementing using the state solution of TELUS. So as a fiscal intermediary, they're a little unique in that they are going with our state solution, which is great. And we really, really are, you know, are in favor of that. We, we allow for you to have your own third party system, but we do see the um, benefits of utilizing the TELUS system. So we have been getting a lot of feedback from traditional providers and self-directed members associated with EVV and the TELUS system. And we continue to work with Continuum to refine the system 
to get all of the members enrolled and all of the staff enrolled on the EDD system so that we can work to move forward to utilize the EDD system. What we really want to do is use this town hall as an opportunity to hear what concerns or issues you may have and what questions you may have. We're going to use that feedback to help ensure the best solution for self-direction while still maintaining our compliance with the federal mandate as outlined in the 21st Century Cures Act. It is, again, very important for you to understand that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services have let us know there are no, uh, no exceptions for self-directed or participant-directed members. So they will need to be in compliance with the EDD mandate. So what are some of the concerns we've heard so far? We've heard concerns around pay rates that, you know, in self-direction, which is how the system was developed, was that you could do differential pay rates, right? We've had heard some concerns that, you know, there needs to be better, better access to the administrative portal because what happens if my aides forget to clock in or clock out? How am I going to um, update those clock ins and clock outs and the manual entries that I need to do now. Um, so right now that would have to be done through the fiscal intermediary. You would have to on those instances and hope they were rare, but we understood that they might be in the beginning much greater than um, once you get up and use and familiar with the system that when you do have to make an manual entry that that would need to go through um, the fiscal intermediary. Codes. We've heard lots of questions about codes um, from participant direction and traditional providers. Concerns about what codes are covered and that there may be coding that is available, not available associated with EDD. So it's important to know, again, and I've said that a couple of times, so I'm going to try not to say that starting sentence again that EVV is only for personal support services in GAP, ICWP, and CCSP in source, and community living supports, basic and extended, in CLS in the now and comp waivers. It does not apply to structured family caregiving in the elderly and disabled waiver. It does not apply for respite. I get lots of questions about respite, and it doesn't apply for respite. It doesn't apply to community access individual or community access group or any of the other services that are available through the now and comp waiver. It is only for community living supports extended and, and basic. So all the community living support codes should be covered. So again, we want to hear from you. What are your other issues and concerns? And we'll get to that in just a second. So. We were moving forward with a um, implementation date starting July 1st, 2021. We have paused that implementation date effective today, and we're going to be putting out some communication shortly about that. The new claims, mandatory claims edit date for EVV for traditional and self directed clients will be October 1st, 2021. So you can continue to use the um, utilize your fiscal intermediary and get paid for services in the modality you do now up until October 1st, 2021. I am going to really, really encourage you, however, to get engaged as soon as possible utilizing the TELUS system in cooperation with Continuum because my leadership has let me know that post 10-1-2021, they will not be granting any additional overall extensions to the EVV program. So that's why that second bullet says, you know, you, you can continue to use the, the continuum portal right now to manage timesheets and schedules, but we would encourage your, your movement over to the TELUS EVV solution as soon as we are up and ready to do it. We will continue to take your feedback and discuss your concerns, and we will continue to communicate on a 
we really communicate almost on a daily basis with Continuum. But we do have scheduled standard meetings every two weeks, and we have another one this week with Continuum to work through any issues that they are having with getting all of their pro their membership enrolled for their fiscal intermediary work and get all of those employees enrolled. Please keep in mind that EVV is a federal mandate. We don't have any ability not to do EVV. Also, it's important to know that the waiver rules have not changed, right? We haven't changed anything with the waiver itself in accordance with EVV. I get questions all the time to the EVV mailbox that are just waiver policy questions or things that are suggestions to change in the waivers. That is not something that's specific to EVV. We do make sure we address them and get them to the proper place, but nothing about the waiver itself has changed as part of EVV. We will provide you with the EVV mailbox. You can continue to send your issues into that EVV ma mailbox, but we want you to be constructive with your feedback. We want you to provide solutions that you think you may have to what your issues may be. Keeping in mind again that this is a federal mandate. It's not going away. It's something that we do have to do or we will not be in compliance with the 21st Century Cures Act. And we as a state will have to pay penalties, which means that we have to look at reductions within the waiver if we have to pay a penalty. So. We want to make sure that we are in compliance with the 21st Century Cures Act. Okay, so what I want to do now is stop and do a couple of things. So our questions and answers can be continue to be sent to the EVV mailbox, which is evv.medicaid at dch.ga.gov. I monitor that mailbox virtually every day. There's been a couple of days where I've missed monitoring it. I was out of town a couple of weeks ago, so I had to do a lot of catch up. So I apologize for those folks I did not get back to for almost a week. But no day goes by when I'm here and in you know Georgia that I don't monitor the EVV mailbox. There are a few others that help out every now and then, but 95% of the time, the person you're talking to from the EVV mailbox is me. I have responded to well over a thousand questions in the last three years related to EVV. Last time I checked, it was more like 1800. So I'm approaching 2000 questions. Um, so it, we, it's a lot of questions, but I do respond to the questions and I respond to every question. Um, now, if you write me the question two or three times in two separate emails, I may just respond to the last email. Um, sometimes I get that where people just keep writing the same question over and over again. I don't know if it's a glitch with their email or if they just don't think I'm responding, but I will respond to your emails. If you have continuum specific questions, they have provided a contact number where they will get in contact with you about your fiscal uh, intermediary questions. And I hear a lot of times from self-directed providers that they don't know what the contact number is for continuum. So it's right here, and this presentation will be posted onto our DCH website in the next couple of days, along with this recording. So you can go in at any time and pull this information out. Um, okay, I'm gonna leave it here for you guys to look at, and I'm gonna answer whatever questions I see in the Q&A. Um, Brian, I'm going to quickly add, um, Kiana mentioned that she's receiving some questions as the host. Um, if folks are muted just for continuity of the presentation, but if you have questions, please do submit them like Brian just said to the Q&A uh, and we'll, we'll go through them now. So versus sending them to Kiana via chat, just posting them in the Q&A would be great. Thank you. So um, the, first, the, the first question is that we have the TELUS application and we don't have 40% of our clients in the system. So if so, if there, and the second question is, will you be responsible for putting the employee's schedule in TELUS? Um, so the first question we need to respond with that, if you're having trouble, trouble with clients and that must be a traditional provider, if it's not, uh, it seems like that would be a traditional provider. 
because if you're a client, that is not really, it could be self-direction, but you would need to call Continuum to make sure that your employees are in the system. If that is a traditional provider that has called in on this webinar, you need to call the call center for TELUS. And those resources are available on our EVV website. You can call the, the TELUS and they will track down where your members are. What we're seeing a lot of time is that you have multiple IDs and those missing clients are on another ID um, and we have to just get them nice and matched up for you. Um, so I would encourage you to do that. Call the call center so they can look into it. Um, as a self-directed participant, you are responsible for having a schedule. And if that schedule is not inputted into TELUS, then you need to make sure you have a manual schedule that is available for documentation. But utilizing the TELUS system, we will need a standard schedule for services. I've had a lot of weird feedback from participant directed uh, members that has said, hey, um, we don't we don't have to um, have a schedule as a participant directed member. And that is just not true. Um, I, I don't know where that kind of rumor came from or that that information came from, but all per all members who are participating in the waiver should have a schedule. An assessment leads to unmet needs, and then that unmet needs relate to having a schedule. So if we need to have the schedule put in by the FI, we will do that. What's iOS TELUS? iOS TELUS is the application for TELUS um, that you are downloading on a smartphone. So any the the next question is we don't report CAI. How do we report how do we report time? As you always have. The services that are not covered under TELUS will be covered as they always have been. My employee cannot um, use the, the TELUS system to enter. I don't want to uh, uh, just give me a second because I need to be able to read and I don't want to give away. Um, so if you have very specific information that could relate to a PHI or HIPAA breach, please make sure that you just send that to the EVV mailbox here, um, because I just want to make sure there's no issues with the information you are sharing. Um, we would need to know why your employee cannot enter the services for CLS. At this time, they're not required to do so, so they can continue to enter the services as of with continuum. So there's no requirement to do that right now. Um, but we will work with you to get that any questions you have answered. Um, I, I, I would need to specifically know in the mailbox why they can't enter the time. Um, yes, the next question is about landline. So there is specific training for those individuals who have been approved to utilize the landline. Um, so we will show you how to utilize the TELUS landline. There's a whole training that is associated with that. So once you are approved, I reach out to the TELUS resources who can help with the use of IVR, which is a land. What is TELUS exactly? TELUS is the EVV vendor. They are now called NetSmart. They are utilized to, there is a federal mandate for continued use of services that require that aids have to clock in and clock out in order to receive EVV services either on a phone, a smartphone application, or via a telephony, which is that landline that I was just talking about, which is just an old school phone in your house. So you will be working with Conduit. Everybody here that is with Conduit will be working with Conduit in the upcoming months in order to get registered, to do your training, to make sure your staff know how to clock in and clock out. I want to ensure you that there's a lot of questions here about, you know, I, I don't know how I'm going to train my staff. 
The system is extraordinarily easy to use. It is uh, the same member ID sign in that you use for any number of applications or internet login or anything we do in our daily life. I literally have thousands of them. And then there is a simple clock in button with a check and a clock out button with a check. So it is extraordinarily easy to use. Um, so, and there are a ton of training resources that NetSmart and TELUS will work with Continuum to make sure that you all have as you move forward. Will the system keep track of current budget? So you will have the amount of information that is available now, including how much you have spent. It is your responsibility as a participant directed member, and it seems like that's what you're trying to do to make sure that you don't run out of units or go over your units. But that is a, that is a component of being a participant directed member. So absolutely you will have that information. So EVV will be mandatory starting 10-1. I'm getting that question, and it is only for EVV. Our old address is in the TELUS system. If you need to do an address change, we get the addresses from MMIS, which is the Medicaid system. Medicaid gets it from DFACS. If your eligibility comes for Medicaid comes for the Division of Family and Children's Services. If you receive SSI and you get your Medicaid eligibility from the Social Security Administration, we get your address from there. You are, you are actually required as a component of continuing to receive Medicaid to update your address. You probably don't remember it, but when you signed up for Medicaid a long time ago, you attested under the penalty of perjury that you would report any address changes within 10 days. So if you if your address is wrong in TELUS, you need to make sure that your address is correct with either the Social Security Administration or DFACS. This is not unusual. We find up to 24% of our addresses in the eligibility systems are not updated when somebody moves. And it is crucial, not only for receiving the correspondence you need to receive, but also for services. You can't get non-emergency transportation sometimes if your address is wrong. So you really, really need to make sure that you update, update that. Can I answer questions without so many deviations? What specifically do you need me to answer? Because I will specifically answer in a very, very, very pointed way. I have no problem with answering questions uh, specifically. And let me also say this, anybody who would like to set up a one on one call with me, I'm more than happy to do that as well. I've done it for about 5 participant directed individuals and multi multi multi. Um, providers as well, so I'm not trying to be vague in any way. That's somebody I think who's not very familiar with me because I make no attempt to not directly answer questions. But please tell me what question you need an answer for. Um, so you apologize for being late. Yes, there will be training and we will go through that training. Will we have administrative account access? No, the FI will have. You were just notified two days ago about the system and transfer over. I appreciate that you, you just became aware of it two days ago, and but we have been talking about this for three years. Um, I want to I want to let you know that I have been doing statewide town halls for over three years. I went to before the PHE. I went to every part of the state, but we did hear you that many folks were not prepared, and that's one of the reasons why we added an extra three months to this process so you all would be able to get up and running. So we have added that time so you would be able to get um, so you would be able to get that information that you need. Uh, as a self-directed member, sometimes your schedule may change last minute. That's not a problem. 
the TELUS system is uh, prepared for that. So we understand that sometimes people go over, sometimes things change, but you do still have to have a standard schedule in the system. That's just a component of being in the label. Can I have a, a TELUS one device in my home and have my staff log in each time? As long as it is a smart device, you absolutely may. Um, as a matter of fact, we have resources that are available on the DCH EVD website that are specific to getting a free smartphone. It's called Georgia Lifeline. So if you um, don't have the funding to get your own phone as part of the some of the federal regulations that have come in, the Medicaid members are entitled to a free phone. And that phone contains unlimited texting and calling. And it also contains more than enough data for you to run the EVV application in a month. It's way more data than we would use for EVV. Um, you could use that free phone not only for EVV, but to schedule doctor's appointments and um, whatever else you needed to do. Emergency services, follow up with your physicians via text. And that's the reason why those free phones are made available. When we get our password for TELUS and participant employee, um, I don't have a specific date for you. Uh, Conduit is working very, very hard right now. We expect that to come out to you in the next several weeks. So just be patient with us. We appreciate your patience, um, but we, you, will, you should receive that information shortly. What if my aid schedule changes? If it changes personally, then you change the schedule. If it doesn't change personally, then um, what you would do is you, a one-time deviation is not a problem. Are all of the FIs using the same process? Uh, they're all capturing the same information because that is required by the 21st Century Cures Act, but they are all using different processes for capturing the EVV information. Continuum is using the TELUS system. Acumen is using their own uh, different vendor, which is called DCI. And PCG is using their own system to capture the EVV information, one that they have made themselves. Can I provide a tablet for my employees to use? You can, if you so choose. You can, we don't pay for a tablet. There is a connection through the federal government to get your own smartphone. We don't use a tablet. You can use the tablet as long as the tablet has a geolocation. First of all, it has to be able to download the app from TELUS, and it has to have a geolocator for clock in and clock out. The mandatory start date for claims processing, again, um, that was the question, is 10-1-2021. Um, Next question is, what if we do not drop them off at home? Like, uh, as an example, if we meet the parents at a different location per the parent's request. There is nothing that prevents um, the EVV services or claims being authorized because the individual is not at home. Services do not start at home. They often don't start at home, and we recognize that, and it's not a problem. The system looks for patterns of consistent um, inconsistency, for a better way. That's a pretty terrible way of putting it, but it uses data analytics, pretty some pretty high-end data analytics to see what's going on. If you are consistently dropping somebody off at a CAG center, that's normal, and we would see that as sort of part of patterning. However, if you're clocking every, in every day in the middle of 285 between the worker's house and the member's house, then Eventually, we, we might have some questions about that. We might say, wait a minute, why are they clocking in 30 miles away every day and not at the member's home or even in the member's area? So it, it's that kind of data analytics that we look at. But just a routine dropping somebody off once at a parent's location or at a restaurant or at a CAG routinely, that will be normative. And let me just stop and say something else here, because I get a lot of questions in the participant direction community about, well, how does this work and how does that work? And what about this scenario? And what about that scenario? As long as you are following policy 
and documenting services and not paying for travel time or extra time or flex time. Many things that I have heard people say that they're billing for now. Billing should start when services start. That's when you should clock in and when services to the member end. That's when you should clock out and it should be documented according to tasks. As long as you're doing that, you're in compliance. There, there's nothing to worry about whether or not that service starts in the member's home or not. So how will the schedule be for CLS get entered into the system? Uh, I believe that schedule will be entered by the FI. We will have to follow up on that question, but I believe the FI is going to have to work with you all to enter schedules. The workday does not have to start and end at the client's home unless you are using IVR. But even in that scenario, we can allow an administrative override through continuum um, and, or otherwise. So there is ways to do administrative overrides if you need to, but just let me say the workday does not have to start at the member's home. Okay, the next question is for a traditional provider. And again, this is a very pointed uh, webinar for fiscal intermediaries. So I'm gonna ask you to send that question to the EVV mailbox, but I, I it is a relevant question. So I wanna be able to uh, let everyone here know how we get our members and our PAs. Our members and our PAs are, are brought in to tell us from a nightly fee through MMIS. So if you have an update to um, your schedule or your PA, it usually takes two days. It takes one day for the source system to get it. That meaning not, not the source, the waiver, but the actual place where you enter the information. Then that comes over to MMIS one night, and then the next night it comes over to GAMIS. Uh, our I mean, it comes over to TELUS, the EVV system. We are more than prepared um, if you have problems with your PA doesn't match up, your services don't match up to what you think it should. We can always facilitate that information through the EVV call center. Um, can we add the notes like we do notes for the folders? Um, not in the EVV, TELUS EVV system. What you uh, wait a minute, I'm going to have to get back with you on that. I believe there is a note section, but all we require in the EVV system is for you to uh, attest to tasks. Now, if there's something that you need to document like goals, then you can continue to document goals on paper. Next question. So the employee clocking in and out on her phone is how they will get paid. Correct. Clocking in and out on the phone is how the member gets paid. Not through a payroll timesheet anymore. What are the required service names? Which one should my employee use when scheduling a visit? So the services are community living support, whether you call that CLE or CLB, which is community living extended and basic, those are the services, community living supports. Those are the services. If you need the individual codes, they are available on the DCH website. So if you go to DCH, GA, EVD, all of the specific codes by category of service, which comp is now in comp or 680 and 681, if that's the service you're looking for, the individual codes are listed there as well but it is for community living supports. Does my participant clock in with me as when, when I clock in? If so, I wake him up at 3.30 when I clock in. No, your, your participant clocks out, signs out at the end of services on the TELUS system. So you don't have to wake anybody up if you're coming in at 3.30 in the morning. Um, I would, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to have some questions about what the services you're delivering at 3.30 in the morning with an asleep member. Um, so that may be a different conversation for us to have at a different time. Um, but it, you don't have to clock in and clock out when the member come, when you, when the member starts, you do have, we have 
member concurrence at the end, but if the member is not able to sign off on the visit themselves, then you can just do an administrative override on the TELUS system and say, hey, the member was not able to clock out for themselves and there was no family member or anybody else to verify. And that is not a problem. Again, as long as that does not become every single time you clock out, it won't even ever set up any kind of auditing. How do you set up a one on one? You email this email box and I will give you some available times that I am available and you and I can have a little combo one on one. That's how you do it. So you just write me if you need to set up one on one for training. You need to do that through continuum. So you need to call continuum about how to get that training, but I'm more than happy to speak to anyone about the EDV system at any time. Again, I have done it for several folks. You just need to request that via the EVV mailbox. Request address change for GAMIS under. So I, I appreciate that, Ms. Hassan, but also even if you update it in GAMIS, it still needs to be updated in the source system because when a mass recall is done, it's just going to override what the GAMIS updates are. So it's really important that address changes are also done in the DFACS and or SSA system. So, but thank you for your input for that. What is the TELUS's website or application? That information is fully available. I, I, don't, I don't have it right here. Um, Brittany, if you could do me a favor and in the Q&A and the chat feature, if you could do a link to our DCH website where all of the information is available, um, step by step, including checklists for members where they can go down and and do what they need to do. How do we set up our schedules that will be done through the F5? Thank you for doing that, Brittany. Can uh, TELUS be installed on an iPad again? I think I've answered that one. Temporary address changes. That's not necessary. If you are if you are doing a temporary address change, for example, for a vacation, we wouldn't ask you to update your your address for vacation. Again, as long as you're documenting what's going on and appropriating cl appropriately clocking in and out, um, then that's not a problem. What is a TELUS component for the home? I don't I don't know what that question means. So TELUS is available either through an IVR, which you can, which is a landline in your phone, or an application on a smartphone or an iPad. Yes, the, the next question is that the person doesn't know if anybody has asked this, but will there be training on how to use the EDV TELUS system? Yes, there's a ton of training that is out there right now that you can utilize and see. There's recorded videos. There's town halls where we've walked folks through. There's step-by-step -step videos and written instructions on how to do things like clock in and clock out. And that information is available for you as well. The website for the free phone, it is available in our town halls. Brittany, I don't know if you can pull that out as well. If you can, it's GA Lifeline, but I can't remember exactly what it is but I know yep. it's on one of our town hall presentations, if you can put that in. Yeah, Brian, I posted the link and it seems to be having, the website itself seems to be having some technical issues. So I'm looking into it. It's just a bunch of HTML script right now. Uh, so I'm looking for a backup link, but I will happily report that out to everybody as well as to the FIs after the fact. I just don't have it readily available. So we can get that back out to you. Yes, so the way the system works is for CLS or PSS, you do have to clock in and clock out at the start of every shift. And then if there's another staff member, they would have to clock in and clock out. You sign in via the application, you put in your name and password, then you clock in when you start and you clock out when you leave. Um, the next question is, is that you've talked to Continuum and you have not heard back from them. They are actively working on getting all those employees uh, enrolled. We'll make a notation and we'll work with, Cond uh, for, with Continuum 
to make sure that they um, get in touch with you and make sure that your employees are enrolled. Um, yes, nothing has changed about your ability to choose an FI. If you want to choose an F, a different FI, or if an FI is in another system and they want to move over to uh, Continuum, they would just let their case manager know. The next question is, so is EVV part of DCI for Acumen? As long as they do time through DCI, the DCI app for Acumen is compliant with EVV. So there's that is if you are an Acumen member, although this is a continuum meeting, you would just get in touch with Acumen and use their system. Um, and there nothing changes about anything I've said other than they're using the DCI system as opposed to the TELUS system. So the rules about picking up somebody at the support coordinator would be the same. Uh, the next question is just to clarify, PAR and other services are not required to be reported on EVV. Yes, that's what I said. Only CLS and PSS are required to be there. So all the other services are not required as part of EVV and personal assistance retainer is not required as part of EVV, which is what is PAR. So it is not an EVV service. The video recording is going to be on the DCH website. Absolutely. Every single town hall we have done since November has been recorded and posted in its entirety. So even where we're repeating the same presentations, we have put both presentations on the website. So yes, ma'am, absolutely. This presentation as well will be posted on the website for anybody's later use. If you want to go in and listen to the Acumen one, it's available there as well. So you're more than welcome. We also did town hall, general town halls this week. So um, last week, so there's two presentations out there that are general town halls as well. So please do, it will be there. Uh, it usually takes a couple of days, but it'll be up a couple of days afterward. If your employee is entitled to eight hours per day, but clock in and clock out is over eight hours, how is that handled? So <clears throat> we pay for services that are rendered. So if your employee works more than eight hours per day, we're going to we're going to pay for the eight hours, the more the eight hours that they worked. But it's important to know that your PA is not going to be increased because somebody worked over. So I'm going to give you a real ex a simple example of this, and this is part of what you have to manage as a self-directed member and also what you what traditional providers have to manage with their employees. If I'm authorized for one hour every day, let's just say I'm authorized for one hour and my staff member works an hour and 15 minutes today and an hour and 15 minutes uh, yesterday and an hour and 15 minutes Wednesday and Thursday. Well, they've used up my hour for Friday because they used 15 minutes every day extra. So now there's no hour on Friday to use. And that's part of not only being an employer, but it's also part of being participant direction, that you make sure that you are appropriately managing the hours and schedules. You would see where the employee clocks in and out as part of the, the time report. So we're working now with Continuum to move the paid claims into their tracking system so that it can be tracked for viewing. Back to the service question. I wasn't asking about CLS. I need the codes in the app like S9122 and T1019. So it depends on, those aren't CLS services, but they are valid EVV services. So they don't mean anything to you, but they do mean something to somebody who's in the comp waiver or somebody who's reserving GAP. S9122 is personal support services in GAP. So I hope that clarifies your question. So that, that is absolutely PSS, but it is not CLS. So it's not important to you if you receive CLS what those codes are. How do we verify the caregiver service on TELUS? 
you you um so there's a button for signature that you sign for there's an electronic signature to verify the caregiver service but the button is if you can't sign for whatever reason the member can't sign or the family member is not there there's a way for the employee to simply override the signature and say the member could not sign and no family member was available to give the electronic signature. So I don't want folks to get worried about that because there were a lot of questions that were, hey, my member can't, I, my, my loved one, my family member can't sign and they frequently drop them off at a day center or CAG. No problem. The telesystem has a button that allows you to get around that. What about respite? Respite is not covered. CAI, CAI is not covered. Again, it's for PSS and CLS only. The employee forgot to check in and check out. They call the administrator, which for continuum would be FI and get that correction paid. You would continue to bill. The next question is, well, if respite is a part of EVV, how do we bill for respite? The same way you bill for respite now. Again, we're working to provide you the website for the free phone. It is available on the DCH website as well. Still confused on how to input schedule for my staff. We will have continuum and tell us talk to you specifically about trainings for how to do that. The, the scheduling is going to need to be put in by um, the the FI, I believe, but I want to confirm that before I make sure so. I'm not trying to avoid the question as the earlier participant said, I just want to make sure that I am sure on my answer for that. But there Brian, are- I can help with that if you need. Yeah, go right ahead. Thanks, okay. Joe. Sure. Um, so the initial connection between the employee and the employer is established by creating the initial visit, if you will. Um, and that is done by the FI, but once that is the initial connection is made, then the employee um, will be able to go to their app and see their employer, and then they can um, create a visit on the mobile device. They, they cannot schedule reoccurring visits from the mobile device, but they can create any visit, so if you, and you can create, you know, obviously a visit for Monday and a visit for Tuesday, you can, you can plan your whole um, schedule out via the mobile device. Um, the FI wouldn't need to do any of that unless you want them to set up some type of reoccurring meeting that would happen for some period of time, then the FI would need to assist with that component. And Joe, I know there's training on you guys' website for that. Is that correct? That is correct. There's a whole series of training on the mobile app and certainly uh, how to like create. I, 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 uh, I hesitate to use the word schedule because that sounds like a long uh, predetermined time. So it can either be scheduling multiple visits or just one at a time. It even gives you the flexibility that if you didn't enter a visit in yesterday in preparation for today, you can enter it right when you're about to start the visit. And and Brian, I added the link for the TELUS training page. I did clarify, again, everybody, I think uh, Joe and Brian have both said it, the mobile application training is the training that you're looking for. There are live webinars as well as pre-recorded webinars available, and that's at that fortelus.com slash training that I posted in the chat for everybody. Awesome. Thank you for doing that. That's great. And then, Brian, one other thing that I'll add, I heard a lot of questions about kind of addresses. So we do get the primary address in the feed for the recipient. The system does allow the administrator to add additional addresses. So in the examples where it's pretty common that a visit could start or stop at a at a different location, you can the again the FI could enter in additional addresses into the system so that when the employee is creating that visit, they would be able to select from a drop down a series of different addresses. 
Great, that's super useful information. What if we go from CAI to respite is the next question. Well, neither of those services are EVV services. That's community access individual and respite. So you would continue to build those services just as you do now. There would be no EVV need for EVV on that. If the employee was paid the wrong amount, how does this get fixed? There is a, a very specific process for um, reprocessing claims. We would really, I would really need to know like what the circumstances there are around getting the paid the wrong amount. We, you, but we will still have the ability within TELUS just as you do now to adjust or void claims. That is existing um, methodology for that. Claims are still processed by MMIS. So the claims are still getting paid by MMIS and they're still getting sent out as they always have to the fiscal intermediary for them to incorporate with their payroll system. So that question was that that really hasn't changed. It just goes from the TELUS NetSmart system to GANIS. The next question is more of a suggestion that the participant should have one login with all the staff names listed and um, where they can click their name and clock in and clock out. So that's that's not really the way that the system is designed and it's not really an option. I know that's the request for an option, but the, the, met, the actual employees have a login and log out. Um, and that's so that we can make sure that we know who the employee is associated with delivering the service. Um, but we'll, we'll certainly look at that question. We take all of your suggestions and comments extraordinarily um, seriously, um, and they've really helped to refine our, the way we do the practice a lot. So we'll, we'll certainly take that back with us. Um, I, I, I have a lot of repeat questions here, so let me go through them real quick and see what hasn't been um, responded to already. Um, so let me check chat as well. Um, and there is one reading. question. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to say that again, uh, we're still having an issue with that GA Lifeline link. It's just not working right now. So I'm going to follow up via email to all the registrants. So if you haven't seen it, um, don't worry yet. And we'll follow up as soon as we have an answer there. And if we need to go through the GA Lifeline people, because just so you guys know, that free phone is not a DCH free phone. It's kind of a federal program, um, but we do have uh, contact with those folks and they're very excited about being able to provide phones to particularly the waiver members. They were, they were very excited about if they could, you know, meet a service need gap we have. So I do want everybody on the call to be able to get those phones um, if, if you need the phone. So um, there is one question here that is again back to the service question, and I want to make sure that we seem to be not communicating well. So I want to make sure that you have this evv.medicaid address where you can also send questions and you can set up a one on one. Your question seems to says that when you try to schedule a vision, it will not allow selecting one of those codes. None of them are marked as CLS. Well, the CLS codes aren't S1922, as you said earlier, or T1019. Those are codes for other programs. Those are codes for PSS and not CLS. The CLS codes start with T2025. So if you are not able to select those codes, then um, there must be something wrong. So make sure that you email me so we can do some follow-up and see what is the difference between the PA that is in GAMUS and what we're seeing in TELUS, because I, I want to make sure that we are we are doing that. Uh, so, so please let's go ahead and, and make sure that you send me that information. 
Um, there's a question that that says, can they just put an X on the signature area? If that's the members mark, that's the members mark. And we've, we've always allowed that. Um, the next question, there's another question here is that says, will personal assistance retainer be accessible in EVV? I, I've answered that and it's no. Um, you, it may have been before you came on the presentation, but PAR is currently a manual timesheet process through continuum and it will continue to be a manual timesheet process through continuum. Um, there's another great question here about what happens if the employee's cell phone goes dead. There is a way as an administrator to update instances where the employee's cell phone goes dead or there's um, the, the employee's cell phone blows up or whatever else. Maybe they forget their cell phone for a day. Um, then there is that can be entered through the fiscal intermediary as an exception. Um, that we we are able to do that. So we are able to account for that. Um, okay. I think I think that's pretty much all the questions uh, that I see. But again, if anyone has questions that they don't feel like were specifically answered, I want to make sure because I did skip through some because they looked duplicative of what we've already been responding to. So I wasn't trying to avoid your question. I just felt like it had already been addressed. But if it hasn't been addressed fully to your liking, then I am going to ask that you email evv.medicaid at dch.ga.gov. And again, I'm going to put this out there again. If you feel like you need a one on one session to talk to me specifically, I am more than happy to do that. Again, write this EVV.Medicaid number and I will um, go ahead and schedule, give you all my dates and times that are available in order to um, set that up. Okay. Um, one last question came in before we end, which is. Um, if there has been an allowance under Appendix K for family hires, they would need to use this system as well until we, of course, until the Appendix K provisions end at the end of the PHE and you revert back to um, the old way of doing things. Um, so those provisions are temporary in accordance with EBB, but until they go away, then yes, you do need to utilize um, the EDV system for anybody who's, who's delivering CLS. Okay, again, I want to thank everybody for your time. Your input and questions are extraordinarily important to us at the department and NetSmart and Continuum because it helps us answer questions, um, fix things that are wrong, and make this make the system as easy to use as possible while still meeting the federal mandate. So I just really want to thank everybody for their time and their participation today. I hope you have a good rest of your night. Thank you.